Thank you, Amanda. And we do remember, keep that, your Bibles open at that. We are returning this morning to Matthew's Gospel over the last, oh, I've lost count, three years. Yeah, three years, I think. We've been doing uh, a few chapters at a time as we go through the year. We started at chapter one at Christmas 2018, 2019. I can't remember what it was now. We're now um, in chapter 11, and we're going to be at uh, chapter 12, sorry. And we're going to be looking at chapter 12 and 13 between now and the end of October. There's a story of who is of someone who is arg- the greatest, uh, pro- uh, arguably the greatest professional boxers of all time. And he was known for being a little bit of a fan of himself. He thought he was great. He was amazing. One day he was ca- getting onto an aeroplane. And as he got onto the aeroplane, he was bragging about how good he was. He was famous. He was great. Uh, and decided that he was important enough to make his own decisions about what he could do and when. And so, when the fasten your seatbelt sign came on, he decided, nah, I'm not going to fasten my seatbelt on the plane. Well, I should perhaps tell you at this point that he quite liked to refer to himself as Superman. He thought he was that good. And so when the stewardess came to him and said, Sir, you need to buckle your seatbelt, he said to her, Superman, don't need no belt. Thankfully, the stewardess was really quick and responded, Superman, don't need no plane. (laughs) Now, I wonder, uh, what attitude... Did anyone guess who he was, by the way? Does anyone know that story? Muhammad Ali, yeah, it was. Um, Does anyone know what kind of attitude was he displaying there? This is where you're going to need your red and blue cards, because all the way through I'm going to keep asking questions, and the answer will be either red or blue. Okay? So I've got this one here. Oops. So what attitude did he display? Was it A, pride, or B, humility? Whichever answer you think is in the air. Was it A, so that's red, Pride or blue humility? Yeah. What an arrogant man. I don't need to fasten my seatbelt. Well, I do like stories like that. We tend to be people who aren't very impressed, don't we, when someone tries to tell us just how brilliant they are. We don't think it's very modest. In fact, immodesty like that is... It, oh, it grates on us, doesn't it, sometimes? And we tend to not like people who make claims like that. We prefer someone who's a bit more humble. The interesting thing about the passage we read is Jesus makes statements that are both really, really um, uh, talking about how good and powerful and how great he is. In fact, he's claiming to be on a level with God. And yet he also says that he has come as a servant. It's interesting because... The crowd sort of listening to him as he speaks think he's bragging about himself from a point of view a little bit like our boxer. That he's just just giving what he's good, good talk, trying to big himself up. But really he's an arrogant person who can't follow through on what he says. Of course, as we've come through this book, we've been listening carefully to who Matthew has been telling us this is. This is God's king come to rule over and establish God's kingdom. He has been sent by God. He is the promised one. And therefore what he says is actually really important for us to listen. What Jesus has to say is, yes, a big claim. But he is also absolutely right in what he says. And we're going to see two things this morning, two big ideas as we go, he is the Lord of God's good law. That's the first idea, and that is going to be most of what we look at. And the second idea, he is the Lord's chosen servant to the broken. Okay, that's the two big ideas. We're going to start with that big one first. The Lord of God's good law. Look with me, if you've got your Bible still open, at verse 8, because that is his big claim. 
Look down at verse 8. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Now the Sabbath was a set of laws about how the Jewish people, who were God's ancient people, kept a particular day of their week. And they do sound rather baffling. So I thought we'd start by going, is it true or is it false, with a whole bunch of laws. So uh, here we go. If you think the law I read out is true, you can hold up your red card. And if you think the law I read out is false, you hold up your blue card, okay? If you haven't got any, I've got some more. If you need some, has anybody not got cards who wants them? Anybody else? Everyone's going, no, please don't give me one. Um, so here we go, first one. In Fairbanks in Alaska, it is illegal to serve alcohol to a moose. True or false? Well, as far as I could verify this morning, that's true. Why you'd want to serve a moose, because they are statistically one of the most dangerous animals you can meet, probably in Alaska and many other places. Um, what about the next one? Um, both the UK and the US have laws that stop people from taking charge of or riding various animals while under the influence of alcohol. I mean, why you'd want to ride anything if you were under the influence, I don't know. I can't, I can't avoid falling off at the best of times. So, I'm not going to tell you the answer to that one yet. Let's have the next one. Uh, there is a city in Arizona where it is illegal to drive a car in reverse. Interesting, a bit more mixed this time. Um, I, couldn't, I, could, I, I could never be a minister in this place. In Nicholas County, West Virginia, the preacher is not allowed to tell jokes from the pulpit. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you whether you wish that was true for me. <laughs> yeah, so all of those actually are real laws. All of them. They should all have been read. I think we all agree, though, that some of those are a little, look a little bit silly. Maybe they had a good point reason at some point, but that's not clear to us anymore. In fact, yeah, even laws that look a bit silly were probably at one time made and enforced with, for good reasons. But they can become limiting and unhelpful if they're outdated, or if they're impractically implemented, they can become a real burden. Imagine if your main business was to sell alcohol to moose. <laughs> Jesus had an interaction in the passage we read with a group of religious leaders who were called Pharisees. They were the keepers of the law of God for God's people. And they believed that understanding and keeping the law was everything. They also believed that their own understanding and teaching of the law was the only correct one. And one of God's good laws had ended up as a burden to keep. Not because it was a bad law, but because it was such uh, the way it was implemented and how they did so much around it. That was the one about the Sabbath. Now, the Sabbath was like a... Oops, no, don't want that yet. The Sabbath was a national day off. A little bit like tomorrow, but only every week. It was God's idea, and it was a pattern that he put in his creation for people to copy. He, it was patterned on the way he made the world. Six days of work, and on the seventh, he entered his rest. And he was there to make sure that everyone had the chance to rest from work and to worship God. Everything stopped because that was the pattern. Now, the Sabbath for the God's people was Friday sundown until Saturday sundown, because, hey, they didn't have clocks to tell exactly, oh, it's midnight, now it starts. But it was part of God's law that he'd given them. Now, what do you think, thinking about it, was it something that was meant to be a blessing, red card, or a burden, blue card? 
What do we reckon? Lots of red cards. Good. It was. It was meant to be a blessing. It was part of God's good plan. All of God's law is like that. It's intended to be a blessing so that we can know God's will for human life and so enjoy life as it was meant to be in relationship with our Creator. So we read two times that Jesus was accused by this group, the Pharisees, of breaking the Sabbath law. Or at least his disciples breaking it, and so they come to him as their leader. Let's remember, though, who is Jesus? Jesus is God the Son. That means it is his law. So who do we think understands best how to keep this law and what it's meant to achieve? Is it Jesus' red card or the Pharisees' blue card? Of course, it's Jesus, isn't it? So we need to listen to what he has to say as they ask him these questions. So here's the problem. The people of the day look at it differently to Jesus. They are the religious people of the day, and what they're doing in that is they make God's good boundaries, God's good law, a burden. Look with me at verse 1, if you've still got your Bible. At that time, Jesus went through the cornfields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to... Oh, there we go, there's a picture. Red card, grumble about being hungry. Or blue card, pick some ears of corn and eat them. What do we reckon? Blue cards, well done. Yes, pick some ears of corn and eat them. And that makes sense. It would have been easy for them to just reach down as they're walking along, pick a few grains of wheat to snack on. Who doesn't like walking where snacks are supplied all the way? The edges of the field were normally left unharvested so that the poor and the hungry and travelers and orphans and widows could eat the grain that was available. Think of it as like first century motorway services. Just probably slightly cleaner. <laughs> A snack to be going on your way with. So do we think that the disciples doing this was okay in God's law? Red card for yes, blue card for no. Of course it was. Oops, I forgot to make the answer disappear there. But the Pharisees come on the scene, Check verse 2. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. You see, the Pharisees had made long lists of the types of work and things people must not do on the Sabbath. And by long, I'm talking like 39 lists of activities. A list of 39 activities that are things that couldn't be done on the Sabbath. And the disciples were doing several of them in the Pharisees' eyes. They'd watched the Jesus' disciples pick a few bits of cord. Well, that's harvesting. Rubbing the husks off. Well, that's, that's, that's working the harvest. Uh, and eating them. Well, that's preparing a meal. That's at least three. And they're saying they're breaking the law. Now, I don't think the, Sabbath, uh, sorry, the Pharisees went regularly to check for people doing this on the Sabbath. They are, at this point, we know from the last chapter, particularly getting quite annoyed at Jesus, and they are looking for opportunities to accuse him and the disciples of breaking the law. There's no way the disciples here, though, are doing what verse 1 would have thought, in verse 1, what would have been thought of as regular work. But the law had been added to, and it... And, and, and are things added, and well, if you want to avoid this, you should do this, and then this, and then this, and this, and this. Uh, and it would become a burden rather than a blessing. Quite often it is true that religious people make God's law a burden by keeping it whilst forgetting God's purpose behind it. It was meant to allow people to turn their attention to him not be burdened with, oh, which law have I forgotten about? So we have a second story a little bit later. Look down at verse 9. It's an, going on from that place, Jesus goes into the synagogue, verse 9. And verse 10, and a man with a shriveled, that is a deformed and unusable hand, sorry, that picture's bl a bit blurred, uh, was there. Looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? The question is, I suppose we're thinking, 
If they're asking that, we should be asking, well, which is more like the purposes of God? Is it, red card, leaving him exactly as he is with his hand unusable? Or is it, blue card, the complete transformation of the man's life? Which one sounds more like God's purposes? The blue one, yes. So, Jesus taught, answers the Pharisees, verse 11, if you're looking. He said to them, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not lift it out? You're not going to leave it there, are you? And how much more valuable are people than sheep? Of course, the law doesn't stop us doing good on the Sabbath, is what Jesus says. So what does Jesus do? Is it red card completely transform the man's life? Or blue card, leave him exactly as he was? Yeah. Which completely transforms the man's life. Verse 13, he says to the man, stretch out your hand. And he, so he stretched it out and it was completely restored just as sound as the other. Two good hands. Hmm. You see, the problem is the Pharisees, in their care about the law, and caring about the law wasn't wrong, but it had warped their understanding of it to the point where they were missing God's good purposes. God is a good God who wants to bless people, therefore his law is not going to outlaw doing good things for people. They asked, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Jesus' concern is, well, what is loving? And Jesus answers them, uh, th th these kind of points, uh, in back, going back to the first story. He's, we have two little stories that Jesus tells them to help understand God's good purposes. Here's the first one. He answered, haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, that's the tabernacle, the tent, where the people could worship God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread. And he gives us the, the background we need, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. So here's the question. Were David's actions within God's law? Yes or no? Jesus has told us in what he said. So they ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do. No, they should not have done that. It was wrong, but in the circumstances he did it, and there is no hint in 1 Samuel chapter 21 where that story is, where God condemns the actions. Why? Because it was to feed the people that needed feeding. Yes, technically against the law, but to feed the people that needed feeding. It's an example of temple law there being broken. That's important in a minute. Let's have another story. This is a general story of how the temple worked. Let me ask you a question. Does working for God on the Sabbath mean you're breaking the Sabbath? Does working for God on the Sabbath mean you break the Sabbath? No. And he, the story and question he asks in verses 5 and 6 is this. Hey, the priests are told by God in the same law that says keep the Sabbath, work on the Sabbath. The priests had to, part of serving God, that was part of their role. It's, I'm glad you said, no, it's not breaking the Sabbath, otherwise, ooh, what am I doing? Eek. You see, serving God in the way God has said is right. It wasn't breaking the law of the Sabbath. Jesus is saying, you've got to think more carefully. What are those laws there for? So let's have a think about some of our lives. Rules that are there, and we just have to think about what they're there for to understand them. So think of this. Imagine you're at home, and the rule at home is nobody runs in the house. Yeah? But, and this is totally imagining it, and we pray it never happens to anyone. Imagine that a fire starts in the night in the house. Are you allowed to break the rule and run away, run away from the fire? Yes. 
Yes or no? Yeah. Yeah, of course. That makes sense. Your parents don't want you to run in the house for a very good reason. They don't want you to maybe bump into things, damage things, fall, hurt yourself. But if there's a fire, well, that's much more dangerous than the risk of bumping your head on the way or running into something, isn't it? Therefore, that rule has a sensible uh, way of being interpreted in those circumstances. Think about this one, then. What if it's your bedtime and you're supposed to be in bed but you hear what sounds like someone falling down downstairs. Are you allowed to get up and go and see if they're okay, even if you're supposed to be in bed? And I mean, I don't just mean, oh, they've dropped something again. I mean, proper fall kind of thing. Yeah, of course, that's sensible. You, it's, a, it's a loving, caring thing to do. It's right to stay in bed. But if someone's hurt, you might just want to check well, check whether they're hurt. Here's the point. Jesus' concern is what is loving. Of course you're going to heal the um, man because Jesus' power can do that and he's encountered him there and then. Of course it's fine to eat if you are hungry. God's law doesn't prevent that. These, remember, these are all laws about how we relate to God. Let's think about what Jesus is saying. He's saying these rules picture something. I say that because of verse 6. Look at that. I tell you that one greater than the temple is here. You see, the temple was a building with, where sacrifices happened and priests served that pointed forward to the time when someone would come and offer a sacrifice for sins for all time. They wouldn't have to keep happening again and again. And that is what Jesus came to do. So here's a question. Is the temple needed now that Jesus has died on the cross for us? Red, yes. Blue, no. No, the temple with its sacrifices are not needed because the sacrifice for sin is already paid. The temple was meant to make you look forward to something still to come. And so we fulfill temple law not by jumping on a plane with a sheep or a goat to take with us to sacrifice in Jerusalem, but by putting our faith in uh, in the once for all time sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. You see, he is greater than the temple, and we put our trust in him. And let's take that thinking then to understand the Sabbath. Let's say Christians do disagree on this. Let's look at the things we can definitely say are accurate. Jesus treats Sabbath law in a similar way to the temple law here. The Sabbath law was meant to be about freedom from work to worship. It was about rest, which is a Bible word that has a meaning more than having a doze. Uh, the Sabbath law, sorry, rest then is about being with God in his presence in good relationship. So the Sabbath is meant to give physical rest, picturing a real rest that we need. And so the Sabbath law is fulfilled when we come into relationship by faith with the Lord Jesus, which frees us from trying to work away our sins, because we can't do that, and frees us to worship him because we are in a relationship with him because of what he's done. And it brings us into that rest. We have peace with God and can rest one day in his presence. Which is what God made us for, firstly and foremostly. See, God's intention, yes, was in the created order to give a space for rest. That is a good thing. God walks in the garden with his people to spend time with them. He rested in order to relate to us. The, re the reason uh, the Old Testament told, told the people not to work on the Sabbath was so that they could worship and relate to God. 
The Sabbath is meant to remind people that you are more than just a worker. Have you ever heard the phrase, I work to live, not live to work? It captures something of what Jesus is saying here. I am more than just a worker. There's more to life than just work. Therefore, it should not be the whole of our week. And so we fulfill the Sabbath law when we enjoy a relationship with God through faith in Jesus. Which is what Jesus said, uh, was, was what Jesus was leading us towards in the previous chapter when he said this, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Here's the third thing the Pharisees miss. They miss God's good saviour. They're so busy trying to catch him that when Jesus then says to the man, stretch out your hand, so that, and it's completely restored, what is their response? Because it should be, wow, we were wrong. Do you know what it is? Look at verse 14. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Now let's just pause. God's, law were, were the, God's laws were also the nation's laws. They could therefore have a national Sabbath. In our times, God's people exist in an international body, the church. We live across the whole world under everything from democracies to dictatorships. Therefore, it is not possible for all believers to always have one day of rest in seven, or for that day to always be the same as each other. Can I say that we don't even meet on the Sabbath? But having said that, a Sabbath is part of God's good given pattern for his world. It's just not its saviour. And in life groups, we're going to think a little bit more about that this week. So here's some questions for you as we think. These are thinking ones, so you can just kind of shuffle your cards for yourself, but you don't need to hold them up. Is the temple law fulfilled in your life because you're trusting the sacrifice Jesus made for you so that you can be forgiven? Another question. Do you enjoy a relationship with God through faith in Jesus, therefore fulfilling the Sabbath law? Or does focusing on rules distract you and mean you've missed God's good saviour? See, if the Pharisees hadn't been so focused on the laws that they'd missed God's good boundaries and purposes and saviour, what should they have seen? They should have seen, oh, this person really knows the law. He really knows God. We really should be listening to him. Instead, they didn't see that. They weren't changed. They didn't see the Savior. And they rejected him. But Jesus' claim is that I am the Lord of what God has said in his law. You can listen to me. But the second claim, we need a Lord of the Sabbath who is also the servant of the broken. So I need you to look at verses 15 and 16, and we're going to do some more questions and votes now. Are you ready? So question, looking at verses 15 and 16, and I'm not going to read them to you. Ooh. Who leads the opposition against Jesus here? Is it uncaring, unrepentant sinners? or the respectable religious people. It is, isn't it? It's the Pharisees, the blue. They are, it's the Pharisees that it says the plot to kill him. They are the respectable religious people of the time. What does Jesus do then, verse 15? Red card keeps his head down and keeps quiet, or blue card makes a scene and challenges them. Here, in this, these verses. What does Jesus do? It's red. He keeps his head down. He moves on to a different place. 
But did Jesus reach? Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, it's fine. I thought I'd put the answer up already. Did but in doing that, did Jesus retreat, give up, and do nothing, or did he retreat, carry on with his ministry elsewhere? Yeah, he carries on with his ministry elsewhere. That's the blue one. Jesus being quiet at this point was all part of God's total plan for what Jesus came to do, to save the world from the mess it's in. So what does Jesus tell the people he heals? We're told he goes around and he heals all their sick. What does he tell them? Does he give them, read, a warning not to tell people who he was? Or tips on the best way to tell the most people? It is the red one. Because at this point, he's saying, keep quiet. So let's make sure we don't get this wrong. Does that mean we shouldn't tell people about Jesus? No. This is a short time command for a reason. He was saying it's absolutely vital that, to be completely silent so that this prophecy can be fulfilled. Look with me, verse 17. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out. Cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. Jesus being quiet at this point was all part of God's total plan for what Jesus came to do. God was preparing for this work for, for Jesus centuries before he actually came. And these verses, I've used this illustration before, are a little bit like a hyperlink for us back to those stages of the plan. A hyperlink, you click on it and it takes you through to more information, doesn't it? And if we were to click this hyperlink, it would take us back to one of the prophets, a man named Isaiah, who spoke about a new dawn and a new day. It's a prophecy that shows clearly that God's servant is not going to be a political figure who will take on the opposition and the rulers of the day. Instead, he's going to be one who gives rest to your souls. So the question is, I forgot why I put that in, uh, who came to fulfill Isaiah's prophecy? Was it Red Card, Martin Luther King, or any other really famous political people you might choose to name? Or was it Jesus Christ? It was Jesus Christ. He came to be God's promised servant, to fulfill the prophecies, and to bring hope and justice to the nations of the world. Not always in the sense, in the way that we perhaps expect. Because what we need is not increasing GDP or better health care, it's not sorting out the economy. And can I say someone wrote these words in 1998? They're so relevant. Um, instead, he spends his time healing because God's great plan is for him to go to the cross. And God's answer is the plan that led Christ, his servant, to, cro to the cross of Calvary. Everything else other than that is a sticking plaster. It's a useful temporary fix but a useless permanent solution. Healthcare, um, humanitarian work, they're all good things, but they don't solve problems. And let's just look at how Jesus does it, just to finish. See, the reality is that everybody, at the end of the day, is, as verse 20 says, a bruised reed and a smouldering wick. What will Jesus do with those bruised reeds and smouldering wicks? Now, first, here's a picture to help us understand. Here's a, a bruised reed. It's a kind of snap, a, a plant, a reed that snapped. What will Jesus do with that? Will he cut it off and get rid of it? Or will he keep it? Here's a, a smouldering wick. Is, is a candle that's kind of just gone out. It's got, you can see, still see the, just a little bit of heat in it, but it's probably going to go out and you don't know if it's going to stay. What does Jesus do? Does he break off and snuff it out? Or does he care for, restore, and revive? Yeah. Verse 20, a bruised reed he will not break. 
and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out till he leads justice to victory. In his name, the nations will put their hope. You see, he doesn't despise us or, our, or our, the fact that we are fallen. He doesn't despise our infirmities. He doesn't despise our lifetime Sabbath-breaking rebellion. He doesn't despise us because of our warping of his good purposes or our missing his good saviour until now. He deals with those things. He doesn't like those things, but he doesn't despise us. No, he sent his son to rescue us. So Jesus makes big claims. He is the Lord of God's good law. A big claim, but that is for our rest and our forgiveness and our future. But he is also the servant of the broken. Because we are hopeless without him. Let me pray and then we'll sing two songs to finish our service. Dear Father, we thank you for Jesus and his careful and right teaching about who he is and about your law. Help us to be faithful in following what we find here in your word. Help us not to miss your good purposes, not to despise your good boundaries, and not to miss your good saviour. Help us to trust Jesus, we pray. Amen.